I don't think we can take one image in the snapshot in time and, and define whether or not this is success or if it's a failure based on this. We have to quantify it based on history, what it looked like before. So let's kind of define that, healed versus healing. Let's take that same patient. Now let's say a year ago I treated this patient, and let's say a year ago it looked like this. And now we come in for the year recall, and now it looks like this. How do we quantify this? Well, I call the distal root healed, and I call the mesial root healing. There's literature reports out there that suggest that the periapical attachment can continue healing for more years after the root canal treatment has been done. So why do we have to quantify our results based on a 12-month follow-up? I don't. So now let's talk about this, success versus survival. Now let's say I take this image and it's six years later. And, and it's not gotten any better in six years. Is this failing? Well, by strict definition of the, of the literature, it is. Uh, let's say the patient's not symptomatic. There's no signs, no symptoms, no swelling, no lumps, no bumps. It's in function. The patient's perfectly happy. Is this failing? Well, I don't think so. I don't touch these. There is what I call survival. And I really think that endodontists should start looking at our, our eva or evaluating our outcomes based on survival as opposed to success or this strict, complete regeneration of the periaqual attachment. Because I'm not going in and retreating that just because there's a lesion. This, this has stabilized itself. Implant literature is based on survival, not success. Who's laying flaps and determining whether that implant is 100% osteointegrated? Nobody. Either the implant's there or it's not. And if the implant's there, it's considered a success. My tooth is there. It's not hurting them. I consider this survival. Success versus fail. Let's look at this now. Now let's say I start off with this as my final uh, post-op image, and a year later I come back and now it looks like this. Is this a failure? Well, I would agree that the literature says it's a failure, but did I fail that patient? I don't think I did. I think I did everything I could. Clinically, I succeeded with what I was trying to do mechanically. I don't think I could have treated this to any better, but for some reason or another, based on those uncontrollable biological factors that I spoke of when we first started, this is not working. So why am I calling this a failure? Because you know why? That puts the onus on me. When we get a failing grade in school, whose fault is it? It's usually the person didn't study or you weren't well prepared. So when I tell him, Mr. Smith, I'm sorry, this root canal is failing, they look at me like, doctor, you failed me. You failed me. I don't want that. I lose a lot of sleep over stuff that doesn't work. I don't need the added pressure of having me feel like I failed somebody. So I call this something very different in my practice. I call it post-treatment disease. That's what it is. I did not fail with my treatment. I established the result that I was going for. It just didn't work. And that's kind of these risks that we take. So during every patient that I treat gets a 30-minute consultation before I even consider treatment. Rarely do I do something called the meet and treat. I always do 30-minute consultations and I schedule them on my time. During that consultation phase, we talk about the statistics involved with the treatment. If they want to take on that risk, they're going to have to assume some of that risk, just like I'm going to have to assume some of that risk. And I never tell somebody they need, need a root canal. I ask them if they want me to do a root canal. Because if I tell them they need it, they feel like they have to do it. But if I give give them their options, I ask them what they want me to do or what they want, because they're going to assume the risk just as much as I assume the risk. Now that's not to say that there's no such thing as post or failing root canal treatment. So we have to define what's post-treatment disease and what's a failing endodontic treatment. This is an endodontic failure, post drill broken off, inadequate seal, and then let's put another post in and crown it. That's not going to magically work. This clinician failed this patient. This is an endodontic failure. We all know upper molars most of the time, the vast majority of the time, have at least three roots, probably four canals in those three roots. We also all see this distal buccal root that's just not treated, but instead of treating it, a ceramic crown was placed. This is an endodontic failure. This is an endodontic failure where we've got a reproducible working length through a perforation through the buccal and it's obturated through the gingiva. That's a root canal failure, but rather than addressing it, a ceramic crown was placed on top. Patient came to see me. We were able to repair and recover from these things, but we have to identify what's post-treatment disease and what's an endodontics failure because we need to separate the science from the emotion. Here's the statistics that I quote my patients based on studies. 93% with a lesion or without, without a lesion, 80% with a lesion. So now I know that if that tooth has a lesion, my success rate, my best success rate under the best circumstances, only about 80%. Let's look at the survival pretty good. So just because it has a lesion and still has a lesion, as long as the patient has no lumps, bumps, swellings, as long as the lesion is not changing size, as long as the tooth is functional, it's survival. I go for these numbers. These I can hang my hat on. 
yeah, I would love to get full bony regeneration around that apical area, but I know it's probably not going to happen every single time that I treat this patient. Uh, when I first started my practice in 2006, I was very, very conservative with when I recommended treatment. I would get uh, these molar teeth referred to me with slight symptoms, but nothing major, asking for my blessing on putting the crown on. So I say, yeah, you know, it's not infected. We're not really doing anything. Go ahead and put your crown on. Then two or three years later, that same person would come back to me now with a lesion. So now I'm much more aggressive with these things. I know I'm going to get a better outcome as far as what we all deem successful if I do that root canal treatment before there's a lesion present. So I'm, I'm justified in treating those teeth. So I, I've, I've gradually changed my philosophy on when I choose to treat or when I choose not to treat based on outcomes. So bottom line is we've got to get the patient's expectations in line with what's possible. And as long as we're all on the same page, I will do everything I can. and I do not give up very easily to try to treat and save that person's tooth. So these are the options that are available in my clinic. But you also may have another option available in your clinic, and the option is to refer. And we can't downplay the, the possibility that, that we may need, that something may be out of our scope of practice. I said when I was a general practitioner that I would treat 90% of what came into my office, but that wasn't 100%. Still, some of the stuff that comes in my office, I don't want to treat. I would love to be able to refer to my partner. I, I do sometimes. Kidding. So, so it really comes down to case selection, what we feel comfortable with. And again, when we talk about those three images, the straight on, the shift film, and the bite wing, uh, there are some people that give me a lot of grief about exposure. Well, your dentist emailed you the images, or I've got this nice paper copy that they printed up on their 1985 printer that's all pixelated. That's really of no diagnostic value to me. So I always have to take my own images, not only for legal reasons, but because of situations like what I'm going to show you here. A patient came in to me. This was an emailed image of this lower calcified uh, incisor here that they wanted me to treat. I'm like, fine. So a patient comes in a month later, and we try to take images. No, I don't want any images. I'm like, well, we need the images. No, I don't want any images. You know, my, my dentist emailed me an image. So finally, we convinced her to take an image, and this is what we saw. She ended up going somewhere else to have somebody do the root canal treatment. And it was way out of their scope of practice. And I would never, ever consider treating a calcified tooth without the aid of a dental operating microscope. No, I mean, loops are going to get you so far. But it's, if, if you're really serious about wanting to treat calcified canals in extremely difficult cases, you're going to invest in a dental operating microscope. You're going to see more, you're going to treat better, you're going to be much more conservative. Again, situations like this, they can be recovered from, but what, it's, it's definitely affected the prognosis. So we have to understand what's within our scope. Everybody's got a different comfort level. Everybody's got a different skill level. I'm not saying that this case is out of the scope of anybody in this room. I'm just saying make sure you have the tools to make sure you can do it at the level that's appropriate. Knowing when to fur, in my opinion, is the mark of a good Great, great clinician. And I will get patients in there that says, well, I remember when the dentist used to be able to do everything for me. Why do you guys all specialize now? When did specialty become the thing? I'm like, well, probably since the 1950s when we were declared a specialty, or 1960s when we were declared a specialty. Like, well, my dentist always used to do root canals. Well, that's fine. But your dentist found that this was out of their scope of practice. And you should be thanking your dentist for not trying to do something they didn't feel comfortable doing and send you to somebody that may have a different skill set. Again, Everybody has the capability and ability to learn to do anything they feel comfortable with, but let's know where those lines are. 